Williams from Washington, D.C., and from the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. This is a live broadcast by EWTN, the Eternal Word Television Network, of one of the most beautiful liturgies you'll ever see, a pontifical solemn mass at the throne. This is in commemoration of the 10th anniversary of Samorum Pontificum. I'm Monsignor Charles Pope of the Archdiocese of Washington, and I'm joined today by Monsignor Andrew Wadsworth of the um, Oratorian Community of St. Philip Neri here in D.C., and the Executive Director of the International Commission on English in the Liturgy. <clears throat> We're going to uh, give some commentary and an explanation of this beautiful liturgy. Monsignor. Thank you, Monsignor. I'm delighted to be here for this very special Mass, and we see the Archbishop is beginning his preparatory prayers before he vests for the Mass. The form of the Mass that we're going to see today, Pontifical Mass at the Throne, is really the form of the Mass of a bishop in his cathedral church at the Throne. And this would have been the most solemn form of the liturgy for any bishop of the Latin Rite up until the time of the Second Vatican Council. You know, Monsignor, what we're seeing here is a vestment that most people never see priests put on. So uh, what, uh, what, what can we say, uh, say about this? I know that uh, Ephesians 6 says that we should put on the full armor of God. But what's the, what the bishop is doing here uh, is, is being vested. So would you perhaps explain that a little bit to us? Yes, the bishop begins by putting on the buskins. These are the special liturgical overshoes that he's going to wear for the celebration of the Mass. And while those special covering of the shoes are being put on. He's praying the prayer, shod my feet, Lord, unto the preparation of the gospel of peace, and protect me under the cover of thy wings. Indeed, you know, in the, the, the full text from Ephesians says again, it says, uh, uh, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So again, this is a, a very biblical as well as a uh, beautifully traditional vesting of the bishop. We don't normally see the putting on of the vestments even of a priest for the celebration of Mass. So this is a very privileged moment for us to witness. And the bishop is being vested in a side chapel, in this case the Chapel of the Miraculous Medal here at the National Basilica. Very appropriate as the Mass that we're going to witness and participate in is a votive Mass of the Immaculate Heart of Mary which in the older form of the calendar falls on the 22nd of August, the octave day of the Assumption, and is the votive mass really that is celebrated on the first Saturday of the month. And of course our Archbishop here is Archbishop Samples, and he is from Archbishop Alexander Sample, and he is from the Diocese of, uh, of um, um, in, 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 not Seattle, I'm thinking, uh, the Archdiocese uh, in Oregon. Um, Portland. Yeah, Portland, Oregon. And um, he, was, he was born in 1960, and um, he got a metallurgical engineering degree in 1984. <laughs> but he was ordained in 1990, and he became the, di the Diocese of Marquette. Uh, he joined that, uh, for that diocese. He studied canon law. And then uh, he became the Bishop of, uh, of Marquette in 2005 and was sent to Portland in 2013. And we now see the Archbishop wash his hands, which also begins the vesting process for a priest in preparation for Mass, and as he washes his hands, he prays, Give strength to my hands, Lord, to wash away every unclean stain, that I may be able to serve thee without defilement of mind or body. As the Archbishop is vesting, we are listening to the Schola Cantorum of the Lyceum School from South Euclid, Ohio, and they, they are singing a number of motets in preparation for the Mass, and they're singing accompanies the act of the Archbishop's vesting. He now stands to, to remove his pectoral cross and mazetta before the rest of the vesting continues. Somebody might ask um, Monsignor, you know, why, why a bishop just doesn't put his own vestments on? Um, why should he be assisted in a way that normally priests are not? Well, I think this is part of the solemnity of a full pontifical function. And in antiquity, 
even in the secular world, great leaders and rulers were vested publicly, assisted by others. And this is something which the church has inherited that underlines the importance of the pontifical act that we're going to witness. So the bishop is assisted with each of the vestments. Now the amice, which is the first of the, of the sacerdotal vestments, uh, a linen rectangle, which in ancient times covered the hood or capoose of those who were, were monks and now is touched upon the head of a priest or a bishop as, as he begins to vest. And as this vestment, the am amis, is placed upon him, he prays, place the helmet of salvation, Lord, upon my head to overthrow all the deceits of the devil, prevailing against the cunning of all enemies. Once again, we're still in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, that prayer taken from chapter 6. Now comes the alb, which is common to all of the sacred ministers, evoking the linen ephod of the Old Testament. As the Archbishop puts on the alb, he says, Wash me clean, Lord, and cleanse me from my sin, that I may rejoice and be glad unendingly with them that have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. This prayer, of course, evokes the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. Now he girds himself with the cincture, praying, Gird me, Lord, with the belt of faith, my loins with the virtue of chastity, and extinguish in them the humour of lust, that the strength of all chastity may ever abide in me. The Archbishop is now receiving his pectoral cross. Interesting to note that the cross that he wears today was the gift of the Institute of Christ the King, Sovereign Priest, when Archbishop Sample um, officiated at the subdiaconate ordination of uh, the order in Griciliano in 2012. Interesting to note that one of the subdeacons he ordained that day is assisting him today as subdeacon, Canon Andrew Todd. And the Archbishop prays, Dane, Lord Jesus Christ, to guard me from all the snares of every enemy by the sign of thy most holy cross. And deign thou to grant to me, thy unworthy servant, that as I hold before my breast this cross with the relics of thy saints within it, so may I ever keep in mind the memory of the passion and the victories of the holy martyrs. We see the, both the, uh, the tunical and the dalmatic are, are being worn by him, and just like the fullness of the priesthood, I guess. Uh, yes. So after having put on the, the stole, which is the, the basic sign of the priesthood, a bishop celebrating pontifically, as you said, wears the tunic, the vestment proper to the subdiaconate, the dalmatic, the vestment proper to the diaconate, and then finally the chasuble. And there are prayers for all of these vestments which explain to us their significance. Here we have the, the special pontifical gloves which the Archbishop is going to wear for the whole of the first part of the Mass. And as they are placed upon his hands, he prays, Place upon my hands, Lord, the cleanliness of the new man that came down from heaven, that just as Jacob thy beloved covering his hands with the skins of goats, an offering to his father most pleasing food and drink obtained his father's blessing, so also may the saving victim offered by our hands merit the blessing of thy grace through our Lord Jesus Christ thy Son, who in the likeliness of sinful flesh offered himself for us. Beautiful chasuble. So the, the final vestment is the chasuble. O oh Lord, who said, My yoke is sweet, my burden light, grant that I may be able to bear it, so that I may be able to obtain thy grace. You know, I, I have to say that in a certain sense, these vestments do look cumbersome. And we've, it sort of reminds us of, of the Mass as a sacrifice. And also all the assistance that he's being given also helps him to pray and stay focused. And 
I would say it's also, I'm sure, a sign of great humility to actually be dressed. Um, the, the, these things help the, the bishop to be more prayerful and also to bear the weight of the office. He has so many there to assist him. That's the case, yes. So he's just received the, the ring, the ring which he received on the day of his consecration as a bishop back in the year 2006 when he was consecrated Bishop of Marquette. And finally, the mitre, perhaps the most obvious symbol of a bishop's office. Place upon my head, Lord, the mitre and helmet of salvation, that I may go forth unhindered against the snares of the ancient foe and of all my enemies. Now, there's a priest standing near him with a cope. Uh, he just went out of range there. This would be the, um, uh, you know, the, the priest who would be assisting him. Want to say a little bit about? Yes. There so. In the most solemn form of the pontifical liturgy, the, the bishop is assisted by a priest in Cope who is perhaps his, his most personal assistant. So as you see here, assisting with the putting on of the incense before the procession for the beginning of the mass forms up. As Father D.B. Thompson, the Diocese of Lake Charles, very skilled in these ancient liturgies. Finally, the Archbishop is brought to the crozier. On this occasion, the crozier of Bishop Thomas Joseph Shehan, the founder of this Basilica Church. An auxiliary bishop of Baltimore, Bishop Shehan was the fourth rector of the Catholic University of America and has the distinction also of being the only person to be buried in this basilica. His tomb is in the first chapel as you enter the crypt on the right. Bishop Shehan, born in 1857 and died in 1932. So as the prelude draws to a close and the procession forms up, soon we'll be hearing the words of the introit begin, the entrance chant for this votive mass of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Adiamus cum fiducia tronum gratia. Let us go with confidence to the throne of grace. That text from the letter to the Hebrews, which opens this wonderful votive mass of the Immaculate Heart. I think the procession is just long enough too that we'll hear some organ prelude music as well. We'll have a lot of assisting clergy in the sense of directly assisting, but also a good number of preceding in choir. That is to say, they're not concelebrating, but they wear cassock and surplice. And maybe you could explain briefly for some of us um, the idea of that the priests don't can celebrate, but they sit in choir. Yes, um, the idea of, of concelebration in the form that we know it more recently is, is an innovation following the Second Vatican Council. In the past, there was a form of what might be described as ritual concelebration, where people were present in the sanctuary wearing the vestments that were proper to their rank, but without necessarily a ritual participation in the action. What we have this morning is a mass celebrated by a bishop, assisted by sacred ministers and other clergy who are present. They assist, but by being present in the sanctuary and vested in choir dress. Hence the, the notion of assisting in choir. You note the two deacons on either side of him now will be the deacons who assist him at the throne. And their dalmatics are a little bit different uh, than the, um, the, the, the other deacons who assist at the altar. But basically there are four deacons assisting him. And the deacons at the chair or the throne uh, don't wear full alb, they wear cassock and surplice and then they wear the, uh, the tunics above. And it's an interesting vesture that's not too often seen today outside the traditional uh, Latin mass. That's true. Those deacons at the throne really represent the senior clergy that have, would assist a bishop in his cathedral church. So 
One thinks that the bishop would be surrounded by, by the, the, the priests of his diocese and among them the senior clergy who might be the canons who would assist him with this liturgy at the throne. We're listening to a rather wonderful piece of brass music by way of an introduction to the procession, once again underlining the solemnity of this occasion. Get a little glimpse of the Trinity Dome up through the middle there that was just completed in this past year. In the shot there with Archbishop Sample is Father Joseph Bissig, one of the founders of the Fraternity of St. Peter and the current director of their seminary in Denton, Nebraska. There's a detailed shot of the new Trinity Dome. the procession. <laughs> The presence of these uh, orders is uh, just a reminder to us of the great dignity of the celebration of this uh, the, the Mass with the bishop. And although these could be done in parish churches, uh, Monsignor, to be done in a large uh, basilica as this meant, brings people from all over and um, adds to the solemnity and the great and grand beauty of these, these magnificent liturgies. Well, what more could one want than the majesty and grandeur of this great church? We see the many servers who are also uh, assisting in, in choir and clergy. You'll note that this crucifix is carried not by a regular server, but by one who's called the subdeacon of the cross, and that's Father Ernest Sibeli, and he's pastor of St. Mary's Church in Hagerstown, Maryland. It's, um, in these pontifical liturgies, it's, it's common to have clergy fill in roles, or sometimes just regular altar boys fill in uh, and uh, it's again a sign of the great dignity of this, uh, this great liturgy. The subdeacon carries the maniple which the archbishop will take the last of the vestments to, to be put on 
after he has uh, said a short prayer following the Confitio. The Archbishop flanked by his two deacons of honor, we've already mentioned Father Bissig. The other deacon of, of honor is Canon Matthew Tallarico, also of the Institute of Christ the King, Sovereign Priest, Chicago, Rector and Provincial Superior. Of course, all of today's ceremony is under the direction of Father Zachary Akers of the Fraternity of St. Peter. Father Akers is Director of Development for the Priestly Fraternity. He's assisted by another fraternity priest, Father Gregory Eichmann, who is chaplain to the Mater Dei Latin Mass community in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I note all the attention to detail and just how the care with which they genuflect and turn and there is um, a, a, a great, great attention to detail as if to say all honor be to God, all glory be to God who deserves our fullest attention and our, our highest honors and our most uh, accurate worship, our rational worship as St. Paul says. So the sanctuary party now entering the sanctuary and the sacred ministers in their, their vestments drawing close to the sanctuary gates now. The gates which themselves bear the inscription et introibo ad altare dei and I will go to the altar of God. We see in the congregation today a number of women religious, men and women of the consecrated life together with many lay people, families, young people, members of the Juventutum movement in support of the traditional Latin Mass. of the Mass is Father Gregory Prendergraft of the Fraternity of St. Peter, pastor of St. Stephen of Hungary Parish in Allentown, Pennsylvania. You can see both the, the newer altar that's used uh, for the uh, ordinary form Masses um, there. It's also used by the Pope for the first time and it's been placed there, but of course they'll be using the high altar with the baldacchino in the back and um, for these great traditional Latin masses, um, this is certainly the altar that was built originally in that period for those, for those liturgies. Yes, the, new, the newer altar was, as you say, Monsignor, used by Pope Francis on the 23rd of September 2015 at the mass he celebrated outside this basilica, which included the canonization of St. Junipero Serra. We're proceeding to the foot of the altar, and many older Catholics certainly remember with great fondness the prayers at the foot of the altar. And so we see as the party approaches that these uh, beautiful prayers will be done by the Archbishop and his assistants, and even as the introit will be eventually sung as well. Yes, as the introit is sung, as you've mentioned, the, the bishop and the sacred ministers pray Psalm 42. And then that leads into the confitio, the prayer that we pray to ask God's forgiveness of our sins. That the greatest preparation for our worship is to be forgiven our sins as we enter, as it were, into the holy of holies of God's temple. Notice how even the mitre and crozier bearers are wearing copes. Let us go with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in seasonable aid. Alleluia, alleluia. My heart has uttered a good word. I speak my works to the King.
the Archbishop now prays the Confitio. Sacred ministers, on behalf of all present, pray the Confitium. So the Archbishop receives the last of the vestments, the maniple. Originally little more than, than a cloth carried on the arm, now stylized into one of the liturgical vestments. Its use became optional following the Second Vatican Council. Note how the archpriest, or it's not the archpriest, it's the assistant priest here, is pointing to certain texts. And this just as a, as a manner of assisting the bishop, who certainly knows the liturgy, but it's just always had additional assistance to help him stay focused and prayerful. So ascending to the altar, the archbishop prays and venerates the altar by kissing it, and also kissing the beginning of the gospel for this Mass. The dignity of the altar is recognized by the insensation now of the altar. And the Archbishop prays as he places the incense, be blessed by him in whose honor thou art burnt. Amen. Another thing that we often see in the in this older form of the liturgy, which is the kissing of things that are handed to the bishop, the kissing of the bishop's hand and uh, of other objects, and uh, again, uh, just a sign of reverence uh, for both uh, the sacred objects, but also uh, for the for the office of high priest. In the traditional liturgy, everything which is concerned with the liturgy, every object, every person is treated with special respect as being part of the, the action which brings about God's blessing. There are very clear directions on how to incense an altar uh, in, the, in the older uh, form of the Mass, and um, bishops and priests are asked to follow that very carefully. So now the Archbishop receives the mitre and is incensed himself before he proceeds from the altar to the throne where he will be for the whole of the first part of the liturgy. Notice that having received the incensation, he blesses the one who has incensed him. It's a characteristic of the pontifical liturgy that all of those who serve receive a blessing on offering their service. Maybe we could say a word while they proceed to the throne about saying Mass in an ancient language that very few people know actively. And, you know, I want to just say that even in Jesus' time, really in the synagogue and in the temple, much of the, much of the liturgy there was conducted in, in ancient Hebrew and people didn't speak that any longer. There's a, there's a certain instinct, isn't there, Monsignor, too? conducting sacred liturgies in, in something other than just the ordinary language that's spoken. That's right, the sense of a hieratic or sacred language. Pope St. John XXIII quoted Pope Pius XI in summarizing this particular idea when he said, in order that the church may embrace all nations 
and that it may last until the end of time, it requires a language that is universal, immutable, and non-vernacular. We recall that of its very nature, Latin is most suitable for promoting every culture among diverse peoples. For it gives no rise to jealousies, it does not favor one group above another, but presents itself with equal impartiality, gracious and friendly to all. Even the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the first document of the Second Vatican Council, Sacrosanctum Concilium, reminds us that Latin is to be preserved in the Latin rites. We're hearing now, uh, even as you speak of Latin, the choir is singing in Greek, uh, the Kyrie. And um, this is a, a beautiful liturgy by, uh, by uh, Thomas Luis Vittoria, a, a priest and composer of the 16th century. And this is uh, called the Misa Salve, and it's, it's an eight-part mass. It's actually two choirs singing antiphonally across the gallery here in the Basilica. While they sing, the Archbishop recites the text of the introit that we've already heard sung and says the Kyrie in alternation with the sacred ministers, reminding us that the official language of the church for much of its third, first three centuries was in fact Greek. Bishop now intones the Gloria. This hymn first heard on Christmas night, the Song of the Angels, is taken up by the choir once again singing the Missa Salve of Thomas Luis de Victoria. sacred text is attended to by the tipping of the berettas at the name of Jesus and also other texts such as receive our prayer and, and um, this is a great attentiveness to the sacred text.
So as the Gloria ends, the Archbishop rises to greet the people with the greeting of the risen Christ. Peace to you. Pax Bobis. He then sings the collect. Omnipotens empiterni Deus, qui in corde beati Maria e Virginis, dignum Spiritus Sancti, habitaculum preparaste, concet concede propitius, ut eus dem immaculati cordis, commemorationem devotamente recolentes, secundum cortum vivere faleamus, Per Dominum Nostrum, Jesum Christum, Filium Tu, qui tecum in unitate iustem Spiritus Sancti Deus, per omnia saecula saeculorum. Amen. Almighty everlasting God, who didst prepare in the heart of the Virgin Mary a dwelling worthy of the Holy Ghost, mercifully grant that we devoutly contemplating the commemoration of that Immaculate Heart may be established to live according to thine own heart, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We now hear the subdeacon sing the epistle, which is from the book of Ecclesiasticus. <laughs> Erusquer futurum seculum non desinam, et in habitatione sancta corum ipsum In this epistle, our blessed lady is compared to the fruitful vine that brings forth fruit which is pleasing and beautiful. Ed in Jerusalem potestas mea. Et radicavi in populo ronificato. Et in parte de me ereritas ilius. Et in plenitude de sanctorum detensio mea. Having performed his service of singing the epistle, the subdeacon approaches the throne to receive the blessing of the archbishop. A privilege of all prelates is to be assisted by the hand candle. I suppose back to the time when uh, particular light was needed to be able to read the text of the Missal. This has been retained as a, a privilege of those who are prelates. The Archbishop is now reading the text of the chants which follow the epistle, which in Eastertide are two Alleluia chants. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. All generations shall call me blessed, because God hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. The Gospel, born by the deacon, is taken to the altar, and the preparation for the proclamation of the Gospel Here in the Basilica, it's quite a long procession to the altar and from the throne and back. In smaller churches, it's not so long, but this will shows you why in some of these, these chants are longer. They, they did fill rather at times lengthy processions in the large churches of antiquity. So 
And we have the deacon approaching the throne now to receive his special blessing before he sings the gospel. He asks the archbishop's blessing. And the archbishop replies, the Lord be in thy heart and on thy lips that thou may worthily and in a becoming manner announce his gospel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The deacon now returns to the altar with the subdeacon to collect, as it were, the book of the gospels and the gospel procession forms up. The incense is blessed for the gospel in its singing will be reverenced by an insensation. Note too how the clergy were saluted on either side uh, by the deacon and subdeacon. It's again just a sign of mutual respect and charity in the liturgy. So the deacon kneels to make his own prayer preparation, and he prays, Cleanse my heart and my lips, O, o Almighty God, who didst cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. Through thy gracious mercy so purify me that I may worthily proclaim thy holy gospel. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so now the sacred ministers proceed to the place of the singing of the gospel. A particular feature of the older form of the Mass in its most solemn forms is that the gospel is sung not as it were facing the people, but ad barbaros, to literally the barbarians. It, it is a preaching to those who are yet to hear and receive the gospel of Christ. So you'll see that the deacon actually is turning to one side in the singing of the gospel. now receives his blessing for the singing of the gospel. The gospel we hear at today's Mass is that which narrates the scene of our Blessed Lady at the foot of the cross. At that time there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore had seen his mother and the disciples standing whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own. Now, you pointed out, Monsignor, before these candles don't have the practical use perhaps they once did to help the deacon see, but now they take up the role of being a sign again of honor for the word of God, as well as the incense, and those who will hear it. Those present reverence the words of our Lord in the Gospel by standing for the singing of the Gospel, whereas up until now everyone has been seated. The Archbishop takes off his might and receives the crozier. In <laughs> 
Filo tempore, stabant juxa crucem Jesu materis, et soro matris eos Maria Cleove, et Maria Magdalene. Cum vidis et ergo Jesus matre, et discipulum stantem quem diligebat, dicit matris sue, mulieri, Ece filius tuus, dein de dici discipulo, ece mater tua, er exila ora, accepitem discipulus in suum. The singing of the gospel completed, the deacon brings the book of the gospel to the throne so that the archbishop may himself reverence it. He does so by kissing the book of the gospels, saying, by the words of the gospel may our sins be blotted away. and the Archbishop is incensed following the singing of the Gospel before he proceeds now to preach his homily, which he will do so today from the pulpit of this great Basilica Church. Bishops retain, of course, the option to preach from the chair, um, but uh, the uh, Archbishop uh, samples that today have chosen to, as you say, preach from the pulpit. And um, it, uh, in times, you know, again, in, in ancient times, sometimes pulpits were halfway down the church. Again, remember, there were no microphones, and uh, so there were different, different ways that, that people and the bishops would, and the clergy would preach, um, sometimes, again, going halfway down uh, so that people could hear. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> My dear brothers and sisters, in the risen Lord, it is with the greatest joy that I gather with all of you this day in this beautiful national shrine dedicated to our blessed mother under her title, the Immaculate Conception, the patroness of our great country. We are in Mary's shrine, and we are all filled with gratitude and joy. We celebrate today this Holy Mass in honor of the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We are all sinners, yet in her Immaculate Heart we find refuge, consolation, protection, strength, and the love of her motherly embrace. Just as Holy Mary stood at the foot of the cross of our divine Savior, where her heart was pierced with the sword of sorrow, so she stands by us today and at the foot of this altar as we sacramentally represent the once for all sacrifice of Christ. As the Second Vatican Council's document on the sacred liturgy reminded us, referencing 
the teachings of the Council of Trent, Christ, who formally offered himself in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross, is now offered in a sacramental and unbloody manner in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And his Holy Mother joins with us in this offering, in the great communion of all the saints. We also gather to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the great gift our beloved Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI left to the Church in his motu proprio Sumorum Pontificum. Dear Holy Father, I know I speak on behalf of all gathered here, those watching this broadcast live through EWTN and many others, when I say thank you for your wisdom, foresight, and pastoral generosity in allowing the usus antiquior of the Roman Rite to once again flourish in the Universal Church. As we gather here today in this magnificent basilica, one cannot help but notice the very large presence of young people who have come to participate in this Holy Mass. I have met a good number of you personally. You are a sign, a great sign, of encouragement and hope for the Church tossed about these days on the troubled waters of secularism and relativism. As they say, you get it. You understand your place in the world and in the church to help rebuild a culture of life in society and a renewal of Catholic culture within the church herself. Over the years, since the release of Summorum Pontificum, I have heard many in the church, including priests and bishops, express puzzlement and dismay over why so many young people are attracted to this venerable form of the Roman Rite. They say things like, I just don't understand it. How could they be so attracted to a form of the liturgy that they did not grow up with or ever experience before? If the comment has been directed to me, I have often responded, that is exactly the question you should be asking. Why are they attracted? to this liturgy, or perhaps more pointedly, what is it that this form of the Roman rite provides for them that their own experience growing up with the ordinary form did not provide? For this will give us an insight into what future liturgical development might look like. Now, I do not want to be misunderstood. I am not at all calling into question the liturgical reform that was actually called for by the Second Vatican Council, nor am I calling into question the legitimacy, the validity, or even the goodness of the Missal promulgated by blessed Paul VI. But perhaps in the actual implementation 
of the Council's directives, not everything that occurred has borne good fruit. And certainly, through liturgical abuses, other aberrations, or simply a poor Ars Celebrandi, the ordinary form of the Roman Rite has too often been disfigured and has been experienced as a rupture with our liturgical past. So, many young people have discovered this form of the sacred liturgy as part of their own Catholic heritage. I myself first discovered the traditional Latin Mass as a college student. I came across it. But for me, it was an historical relic and something that I never imagined that I would actually experience. Maybe the experience of these young people growing up with the ordinary form did not carry with it the beauty, reverence, prayerfulness, sense of mystery and transcendence, or wonder and awe that the traditional Latin Mass has provided for them. Perhaps this is the answer to the question posed above about why so many young people are drawn to the Holy Mass celebrated according to the 1962 Missal. Pope Benedict XVI referenced this in his letter to the world's bishops, which accompanied the release of Summorum Pontificum. In speaking of Pope St. John Paul's own efforts to pastorally provide for those attached to the traditional liturgy, which the saintly Pope did through his own motu proprio, Ecclesia Dei, in 1988, Pope Benedict wrote this, quote, immediately after the Second Vatican Council, it was presumed that requests for the use of the 1962 Missal would be limited to the older generation, which had grown up with it. But in the meantime, it has clearly been demonstrated that young persons too have discovered this liturgical form, felt its attraction, and found it a form of encounter with the mystery of the Most Holy Eucharist particularly suited to them. Thus the need has arisen for a clearer juridical regulation which had not been foreseen at the time of the 1988 motu proprio." Unquote. Now, I don't want to forget that older generation of Catholics who have remained attached to this ancient liturgy. You are important as well. This is the Mass of the Ages that has nourished the faith life of generations and generations of Catholics, including my parents' generation. I often think about that. This is the Mass that my grandparents participated in. This is the Mass that nourished the faith and devotion of my mother growing up, God rest her soul. This is the Mass that drew my father to the church and helped fuel his conversion. This is the Mass that has produced saints. I believe one of the most important phrases in the letter of Pope Benedict XVI referenced above is this, quote, there is no contradiction between the two editions of the Roman Missal. In the history of the liturgy, 
there is growth and progress, but no rupture. What earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too. And it cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden or even considered harmful. It behooves all of us to preserve the riches which have developed in the church's faith and prayer and to give them their proper place." Unquote. As we continue our celebration of the 10th anniversary of Summorum Pontificum, I watch, wish to touch upon one final point. This has to do with the positive motivation of the Pope Emeritus in issuing the motu proprio. He said that it is a matter of coming to an interior reconciliation in the heart of the church. During my ad limina visit to Rome in the year 2012, and during our visit with Pope Benedict XVI, I had the opportunity to thank him for the gift of Summorum Pontificum. He responded at length to my intervention, beginning by saying that he had issued the motu proprio in order to reconcile the church with her past. This reconciliation the Pope Emeritus spoke of involves learning from the experience of the sacred liturgy according to the Usus Antiquior in order to better inform and shape our understanding and celebration of the newer Roman Rite. With both liturgies flourishing side by side, there could be a mutual enrichment of the two forms of the one Roman Rite, perhaps leading to further liturgical development and progress. After mentioning some ways in which the Roman Missal of 1962 could be enriched by the newer Roman Missal, Pope Benedict said this about how the more ancient form of the liturgy could enrich the newer form. Quote, the celebration of the Mass according to the Missal of Paul VI will be able to demonstrate more powerfully than has been the case hitherto the sacrality which attracts many people to the former usage. The most sure guarantee that the Missal of Paul VI can unite parish communities and be loved by them consists in its being celebrated with great reverence, in harmony with the liturgical directives. This will bring out the spiritual richness and the theological depth of this Missal. I believe this is a key to interpreting Pope Benedict XVI's desire, namely, that the flourishing of the more ancient form of the liturgy with its beauty, reverence, and sacredness will cause a natural development and enrichment of the way in which the newer Mass is celebrated. As he says, there cannot and should not be a rupture between the two forms, one must be able to recognize the older Roman rite in the newer. I often get the impression that many people in the church live their lives as if the church sort of hit a reset button at Vatican II, and that the past no longer has relevance, especially regarding the sacred liturgy there must be further liturgical growth and development along the lines of a hermeneutic of continuity with the past. And any experience of rupture must come to an end. May it be so. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, let us give thanks to God for the life, pastoral ministry, and courage 
of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Let us thank the Lord for both Pope Benedict's gift to us, the greater celebration and availability of the usus antiquior of our common heritage in the Roman Rite. Let us pray for Pope Benedict XVI, that the Lord grant him peace and joy during the time the Lord allows him to be on this earth praying and sacrificing for us. We take our prayers and gratitude now to that greatest of all acts of thanksgiving, the celebration of the Most Holy Eucharist. Let us go unto the altar of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A wonderful sermon by Archbishop Sample. We thank the people of Seattle for putting him on loan to us this weekend here. And uh, he began his reflections by a reminder that um, Our Lady, we find refuge in her Immaculate Heart and that she stands with us in this holy sacrifice of the Mass. And just before he intones the, the creed, we want to just again acknowledge the, the great uh, love that he, he has for the, uh, what he calls the Usus Antiquor, sometimes called the extraordinary form. And what it offers to us. And he spent a lot of time speaking of how young people are so uh, drawn to this liturgy and uh, how that has surprised some, but, but not him. Because <laughs> he's, you know, he's, he's almost from that same generation who felt they didn't receive all this. Well, let's pause here for the intonation of the creed. Red The credo draws to an end now. We see the deacon approaching the altar to spread the corporal, which tells us that in a few moments the bishop will be coming to the altar to proceed with the offertory of the Mass. 
I certainly hope that everybody can hear how the whole congregation is singing Credo 3. You hear the whole place thundering with all the voices, and it's probably the best known version of the creed in Latin. I was saying earlier that I was happy that the uh, Archbishop used the term Usus Antiquor, uh, the uh, Antiquor, because sometimes I think extraordinary form and ordinary just hasn't stuck. Uh, but the older form, that's basically what it means, the older usage. But it's, uh, I'm so happy that he emphasized there is to be no rupture, but rather uh, that, uh, that this beautiful form of the liturgy is, should be a great uh, recovery of some of the things that have been left behind, not so much by the Mass, but by our culture, and um, help to inform uh, both forms of the liturgy can, can have good influence. And we thank God for this option that the Holy Father insisted that we have always had to celebrate this beautiful form of the liturgy. The Archbishop rises to greet the people, which is followed by the Offertory Chant. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, because he that is mighty hath done great things for me, and holy is his name. Alleluia. The Archbishop, as he said, he made some very personal remarks in the homily about how he himself had been very uh, moved by the this form of the liturgy early on, uh, even before um, it was as widely permitted as it is today. And, um, you can see his attention to detail, and uh, he's been one of the uh, prelates who has been very outspoken of the beauty of this and has uh, helped to promote it. Now, as we go to the altar, Monsignor, I want to ask you, uh, maybe we could reflect together for a minute, the idea of facing to the east. Just before we get to the altar, you'll see that the Archbishop as his hands washed at the throne, he removes the gloves, and this is now a final preparation before he ascends to the altar to offer the sacrifice. The eastward-facing position of the altar is certainly a very ancient practice of the church, looking to the east, looking to Eden, looking to the, the coming once again of Christ, the idea that we are all facing the same direction, that we are turned, as it were, to the Lord, is an idea that St. Augustine was greatly inspired by. In fact, he mentioned this at the end of many of his homilies, that the direction of the liturgy is to God, that all of our prayers, all of our offering is to him. And the ancient idea is that that was best expressed by everyone facing eastward, or at least, if not, the compass east, the liturgical east. Yeah, no one has their back to anyone else. Everyone's facing God. We're all looking uh, to the Lord to come again in glory. We're looking to the east. And Jesus, indeed, will return uh, in glory from the east. So we see the Archbishop passes now from the throne to the altar. One other thing we've noticed, Monsignor, is that he has two different mitres. One is very ornate and the other is beautiful but not less ornate. He's wearing the very ornate one now. He wore a different one when he preached. Yes, he wears the, the more ornate mitre for the various processions at the beginning at the end of the mass the procession now to to the altar and the less ornate but golden mitre for the rest of the mass you mentioned at an earlier point that often particularly in the great cathedrals the distance covered in these processions was quite considerable we hear the choir begin the Ave Maristella of Claudio Monteverdi. This is the Vesper hymn common to the office of our Blessed Lady. From the great Vespers that he wrote. 
these um, this type of music um, comes from parts of Europe again where large churches predominated and in Vienna, of course, there was the beautiful St. Mark's and sometimes four choirs singing back and forth across the gallery and in the larger Roman churches, too. And these uh, this kind of colossal sound, it's called. And you hear sometimes sackbuts and other trumpets giving support. And it's, it's a great, great celebration of, of joy in the presence of the Lord. As the Archbishop prepares now to offer the sacred host and to pray for the blessing of the chalice which will be mixed in just a moment. All of these prayers which for the most part date from the, the Middle Ages are very expressive of the sacrificial nature of the Mass. The chalice being used at today's Mass was the Shrine's first chalice made in Baltimore and consecrated on the 8th of December, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, in 1917. A precious link with the, the beginning of this great church. of what happens at the altar, of course, is not seen by many people in the congregation, but who are participating nonetheless, following the action of the Mass that they know is taking place at the altar. The mixing now of the chalice, the deacon pouring the water, the subdeacon, the small quantity, sorry, the deacon pouring the wine, the, the subdeacon, the small quantity of water. That's that little drop of water which represents our humanity. The Archbishop prays that just as Christ took upon himself our humanity, may, we may come to take upon ourselves his divinity. Bowing down, the Archbishop prays, in a humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be received by thee, O Lord, and may our sacrifice be so offered in thy sight as to be acceptable. Come, O Holy Spirit, sanctifier and almighty and eternal God, and bless this sacrifice prepared for the glory of thy holy name. So the, the gifts are to be incensed and then the altar incensed and then all presents beginning with the celebrant the archbishop are incensed so a recognition at this point that that all things all people who are taken up into the offering of the holy sacrifice are thereby made holy by their participation in this most holy mass these beautiful prayers say that uh, may this incense blessed by you, O Lord, ascend to you, O Lord, and may your blessing descend upon us as the, these words are said in Latin as he swings a thurible. And as he incenses the altar, he says, let my prayer rise like incense, O Lord, the lifting of my hands like an evening offering. wonderful choir of this national basilica providing the polyphony of Victoria's Mass and at this moment the Ave Maristella of Monteverdi's Vespers. The plain song proper of the Mass is being sung today by the Schola Cantorum of the parish of St. Mary Mother of God here in Washington DC, one of the parishes that has the older form of the Latin Mass every Sunday and, and is a place where the Latin Mass community thrives and is cared for. 
And the uh, Shrine Choir is directed by Dr. Peter Latona, and it's, um, they do such magnificent work Sunday after Sunday. And this uh, music, um, this is one of the high watermarks, really, of Renaissance music we're hearing right now, Monteverdi's Ave Maristella. Having completed the incensation of the gifts and the altar, the Archbishop now washes his hands. And he prays, I will wash my hands among the innocent and will encompass thy altar, O Lord, that I may hear the voice of thy praise and tell of thy wondrous works. O Lord, I have loved the beauty of thy house and the place where thy glory dwelleth. Take not away my soul, O God, with the wicked, nor my life with men of blood, in whose hands are iniquities, their right hand is filled with gifts. But I have walked in my innocence, redeem me and have mercy upon me. My foot hath stood in the direct way. In the churches I will bless thee, O Lord. Note again the care with which the um, assisting priest uh, takes care of the bishop and makes sure the books and things are in place. He points to the text. And again, this is not a sign that the bishop is in any way confused. It's a, again a, just a work of charity to help him to be focused on praying, not looking what, what page number or we need to go to. The bishop now concludes the offertory with the great prayer, Sushipe Sancta Trinitas, receive, O Holy Trinity, the prayer common to all of the Western rites. Goes back to the early centuries of the church. He then turns and, as it were, invites the prayers of those present. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. He then prays, the secret prayer, not heard, but a prayer which, which is the conclusion, as it were, of the offertory before he, we begin the great prayer of the preface and the canon of the Mass, the Eucharistic prayer. While this continues, the choir are being incensed, the clergy present in the sanctuary, and then finally, the great throng of the faithful present in the name er of the Basilica. Secula, secula and so the preface of our Blessed Lady begins. Dominus Sagamus Domino Deo Nostro Vere dignum et justum est ecum et salutare Nos tibi semper et ubique gratia sagere Domine Sancte Pater, Omnipotens Eterne Deus, et in veneratione Beate Maria Semper Virginis collaudare, benedicere et predicare, que et unigenitum tum, Sancti Spiritus obrum ratione concebi, et virginitatis gloria permanente, lumen eternum mundo e fudit, Iesum Christum Dominum nostrum. Per quem maestatem tuan laudant angeli, adorant dominationes, tremum potestates. Celi celerumque virtutes, ac beata seraphim, socia exultatione concelebrant. Cum quibus et nostres voces, 
ut et miti jubias de precamur, suplici confessione dicentes. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. As the preface reaches its conclusion, having summoned the powers of heaven and all the saints, we sing the thrice holy hymn, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. While the Sanctus is being sung, the Archbishop continues with the canon of the Mass, the Eucharistic prayer which in the earlier form of the Mass is that prayer which we know as the Roman Canon, the first Eucharistic prayer. I might also say here, um, Monsignor, that some people say, well, I can't hear the priest praying when the old Mass is being said. And again, remember that this prayer is wholly directed to God the Father. It is, um, God is neither deaf and he knows Latin, and um, this prayer is directed to God, and although there is a value in it, perhaps us hearing, the, the older form tended to treat it almost like an, a, a verbal iconostasis. The priest goes behind and speaks to God on our behalf. And uh, this is the insight of the, the more ancient form of the liturgy. So as we approach the offering of the sacrifice, so the silence increases, and very shortly, this great song of the Sanctus will give way to a holy silence as we come nearer to the moment of the consecration of the bread and wine. Immediately following the elevation of the chalice containing the precious blood, we see that the Archbishop continues to pray quietly the remainder of the canon. It's traditional also to sing the Benedictus, which is often sung together with the Holy Holy today, but often in the older rite it's, it's, it's split. We also note his canonical fingers. These uh, thumb and forefinger are not unjoined because of the precious host that he's just touched. And they remained so joined until they are purified after Holy Communion. As you say, the, the fingers which have touched the sacred host now shall touch nothing else.
In these prayers which follow the consecration, the bishop prays that the effects of the holy sacrifice will be evident not only in the life of the church but also in the sanctification of the world. We ask God to look kindly upon the sacrifice which is offered, which is, is of course the sacrifice of his son. By the mystery of the mass, the same sacrifice which Christ offered on Calvary, the sacrifice of himself is made present to us and we are made present to that sacrifice. As the canon reaches its conclusion, the bishop prays through him and with him and in him unto thee, God the Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor. Per omnia secula seculorum. Communion right now begins with the praying of the Lord's Prayer. Et divina institutione formati, autemus dicere, Pater noster qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, Sicut in cielo et in terra, panem nostum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. The subdeacon who has been holding the pattern, the, the precious golden plate upon which the host is placed, he's been holding this patiently at the foot of the altar up until this point since the offertory returns the pattern to the altar and it is placed under the host. This is a reminder of the practice in the early church whereby in Rome a small particle of the host from the celebration of the Pope's Mass was was carried with great reverence to other celebrations of the Mass and so expressive of the communion, the ecclesial communion of the Church as made manifest in the celebration of the Mass. So a tiny portion broken from the host is dropped into the chalice of the precious blood. And this uniting of the body and blood of Christ reminds us that in our Lord's resurrection, not only were, were his body and soul reunited, but also we have the great hope of eternal life. The Archbishop now prays in preparation for the giving of the sign of peace which is given first to the sacred ministers and then, as it were, spreads out from the altar to the clergy present in the sanctuary. While this is taking place, the choir sings the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. to underestimate the splendor with which the, this music was regarded in the 16th century. You know, people didn't have stereos and things like that. They, they went in the sonic experiences of these churches, just mesmerized them with the sense of the holiness of God. And 
There's also something here of the music of the spheres. Um, at the time of the 13th century, some of the um, Greek, uh, Greek philosophers, some of their writings were rediscovered in a certain sense. And they spoke of, as the planets circled around the sun, they each had a, a tone and they made a beautiful celestial harmony. And this music of the spheres is what Renaissance polyphony is uh, sort of emphasizing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, the cosmos and the whole of all creation singing in harmony to God. As this beautiful Agnus Dei continues, the, the Archbishop himself receives Holy Communion. He's just prayed, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And as the Archbishop receives the precious blood, he prays, What return shall I make to the Lord for all that he has rendered to me? I will take the chalice of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Praising him, I will call upon the Lord and shall be saved from my enemies. The Archbishop now turns to hear the confitio which is prayed behalf on all of those who will receive Holy Communion at this Mass, asking for the forgiveness of their sins in a final moment of preparation. Idio preco beat Mariam semper virgin, beat me kerma cancel, beat me orem baptista, Santus apostolus patrum et paulum, omnes sanctus et e pater, orari pum mea dominum deum vostrum. Miseriata vestri omnipotens Deus et demisis peccatis vestris producat vos et vita me eterna. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you your sins, and bring you to life everlasting. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, absolution, and remission of your sins. Behold the Lamb of God. Ecce on you stay, ecce qui tole peccato mundi. Domine non sum dignus ventris et tecum meum, sed tantum e verbo et salamitur anima mea. Domine non sum dignus ventris et tecum meum, sed tantum e verbo et salamitur anima mea. Domine non sum dignus ventris et tecum meum, sed tantum e verbo et salamitur anima mea. Noted, Monsignor, the um, the way the Archbishop uh, is grateful for those who serve and care for the sacred liturgy, and, and for him. And uh, among the blessings is to he gives communion to the, the servers, to the, uh, the altar servers, the acolytes, and other sacred ministers who are going to receive. The other thing that you we we should maybe say a little word about is I I don't know if I've ever counted the number of genuflections when I say the old array, but it's got to be at least twenty five. There's a lot of um, genuflecting, and um, you got to have good knees. But on the other hand, um, it is, again, this sign of amazing reverence that we're in the presence of God. And um, we continuously acknowledge that. It's not just something we're vaguely aware of, but any time one crosses the center of the altar or before receiving and so on, all these genuflections take place. And it's just built into the liturgy, isn't it? It's a reminder that... The only reasonable response to the mystery is that we bow the knee, we adore God as we are present to his mystery. We see now that 
those who are in choir, who are receiving Holy Communion, among them seminarians, religious. I just see a few ordinary altar boys in the line there too. <laughs> Indeed. The scholar have just sung the communion verse. Jesus said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. A couple of other th uh, maybe items of gratitude here that we might want to say that first of all, I hope that you can see the kind of training and care that the sacred ministers um, exhibit. This, this requires a great deal of holy learning, a kind of theology on the knees, and um, so much care and training is, is, is needed and, and yet they, they undertake this. I'd also like to at this time give special thanks. This liturgy is really made possible uh, through the Paulus Institute. It's a group of um, benefactors who uh, uh, underwrite the cost of these liturgies, uh, which is not insignificant, and um, you're encouraged uh, to, be, to be as generous as you ever can to them. Um, if you've enjoyed this, uh, to, you'll certainly uh, see references, uh, but they can always be reached at the Paulus Institute. Dot org, all one word, the Institute.org. And these are a group, as I say, of um, benefactors who love this liturgy and want to see it flourish. And um, they, they have uh, underwritten the cost today. During the distribution of communion, the choir will sing Caro me avere cibus by Pierre de Manchincourt. My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And the setting of the Corpus Christi text, O Sacrum Convivium, O Sacred Banquet, wherein Christ is received, by the English 16th century composer Thomas Tallis. Then we will hear two Marian texts, Beates Virgo Maria, a setting by Vincenzo Ugolini for 12 voices, and the Magnificat for eight voices of Luca Marenzio. And we'll note here that communion is received on the tongue and kneeling, and the chin patents are used. All of these again showing great care uh, for the sacred host of our, the body of our Lord, that nothing be lost or dropped. And also, again, just the reverence that kneeling is itself. Every sign and symbol in the liturgy is to underline for us that God is powerfully present, not just in the way that he is present when we gather to praise him, but present particularly now in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, by which Christ is received body and blood, soul and divinity. Here we see Dom Daniel Oppenheimer, the founder of the Canons of the New Jerusalem, distributing Holy Communion. There is a longer form. In the newer rite, it simply said, the body of Christ, and one responds, Amen. Whereas in this rite, Corpus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Exodi Animam Tum and Vita Materna, may the body and the blood of our Lord uh, guard your soul unto life eternal, and the priest also provides the amen. Kneeling to receive Holy Communion also affords everyone a moment of preparation before they receive communion and a little moment of thanksgiving before they return to their place.
Luther's sermon, the Archbishop spoke of continuity and the beauty of continuity. And uh, I'm also mindful that uh, Chesterton said that tradition is the democracy of the dead. The dead get a vote. <laughs> and uh, we, um, as I said, this, this is the, the mass that most of the saints knew. And uh, certainly there is great beauty and can be great beauty in the newer forms since 1970. But if you look back into church history, the Roman canon goes back as early as the 5th century. And um, most of the elements of the liturgy were well in place uh, by that time. There have been, over the centuries, a few additions. Um, but fundamentally, it's been intact. And it's been a very stable and beautiful form of the liturgy uh, for so, so long. It's also a powerful reminder to us that the liturgy is something which we receive as a gift from the church. It's not something that we make for ourselves and is perhaps the most powerful way in which we ourselves participate in God's life, the greatest channel of God's grace to us. For those who are not familiar with the National Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, perhaps just to say a little word about this great church, which was Pope Pius X in 1913 who approved the notion of a national shrine to be built in the United States. And the cornerstone for the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception was laid in 1920. The crypt church was completed in 1926. The rest of the crypt level finished in 1931. The church is Romanesque Byzantine in style and made entirely of stone, brick, tile and mortar. There are no steel structural beams, framework, or columns found in this building. The first Mass was celebrated on Easter Sunday of 1924. Construction of this shrine was ongoing but temporarily paused during the Depression and World War II. The building was resumed for the Great Upper Church in 1954 and it was completed in 1959 and its dedication took place on the 20th of November of that year. St. John Paul II was the first reigning pope to visit the Basilica and his visit took place in 1979. He would later elevate the National Shrine to the status of a minor basilica in 1990. Pope Benedict XVI visited the Basilica in 2008 he gave a rare bestowal of a golden rose for our Mother Mary, an honor which dates back to the 11th century. Pope Francis visited the Basilica during his visit to the United States in 2015 and on the 23rd of September celebrated a mass during which he canonized St. Junipero Serra. Every year about a million people visit the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception and every day many masses and hours of confessions are made available for the faithful and the pilgrims who come to the nation's capital particularly to visit this church. There are over 70 individual chapels, all of them dedicated to the Blessed Mother within the Basilica's walls. The seating capacity of the upper church is 3,500 and with the total capacity with the lower crypt church and all of the side chapels of some 6,000 people. In addition to being the largest Roman Catholic church in North America, it is among the 10 largest churches in the world. I've um, spent all my time here in Washington seeing this beautiful basilica be enhanced and beautified and the Trinity de Dome was just finished this last year and um, that really brings a formal completion to the building of the beautiful edifice but obviously repair work will go on all the time. <laughs> but I've looked up into the face of Christ seated in majesty over the high altar and I know that people have different feelings about that but I've become accustomed to looking into his face so strong, so certain, saying have confidence, I've overcome the world.
as the many faithful who are present at this Mass approach the communion rail to receive Holy Communion. Perhaps it's an opportunity for those of us who are participating by watching this Mass on television or through intimate internet transmission to ourselves to make an act of spiritual communion. Lord, I truly believe you are present here in the sacrament of your body and blood. I adore you with profound reverence, and though I cannot receive you in Holy Communion, I ask you to come at least spiritually into my soul. In both this form of the liturgy and in the ordinary form of the liturgy, the choir that you're hearing there, is just, they do outstanding work, Sunday after Sunday. And um, the sacred liturgies that are conducted here always have this great and beautiful music and this wonderful choir that we're hearing. A powerful reminder to us that Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the first utterance of the Second Vatican Council, reminds us that the great treasures of the Church's music are to be retained, particularly Gregorian chant, which is proper to the Roman liturgy and to be given pride of place, and also the repertoire of polyphony. We've heard both of those types of music very much in this Mass. Gregorian chant, which is a form of music only known within the liturgy. It has no secular counterpart as such. Most perfectly suited to the worship of God. There's an additional purpose to the altar rail. It's not only a place to kneel and receive communion, but it also demarks the sanctuary from the main nave or body of the church. And some of our newer churches have had poorly set this forth. Uh, a rail wasn't uh, simply uh, simply the place, but it did say, "Well, this is the this is the part of the church where where the holy sacrifice is done with the priest and the sacred ministers." And it's sort of the Western version of the iconostasis. And as I say, I think that in, in some ways we need to recover that more in our churches today. You're absolutely right. It is the iconostasis. It just became rather low as a screen in the West, but it does, as you say, mark the demarcation of the altar and its precincts from the rest of the church. The ancient idea being that the altar represents heaven and its life, and that we pass in the liturgy from the life of this world to the life of heaven. Bishop is returning now to the altar with the sacred ministers and what remains of the Blessed Sacrament will be consolidated and taken to the tabernacle in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel of the Basilica. Everyone on the sanctuary still at this stage remains kneeling in acknowledgement of the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Only when the last vestiges of the Blessed Sacrament have been removed from the altar will people sit or stand. You may have noticed that the, as he went up the steps, the care with which the uh, deacons assisting him lift his, um, his uh, alb must he trip. And uh, again, just an act of charity, but also again, a great sense of reverence for the fact that the Archbishop represents Christ, the High Priest.
the Archbishop proceeds with the cleansing, the ablutions of the sacred vessels, praying, Grant, O Lord, that what we have taken with our mouth we may receive with a pure mind, and that from a temporal gift it may become for us an everlasting remedy. The place of the tabernacle was generally to be favored on the altar of a parish church. Um, in a large basilica like this, it, you'd almost need binoculars, you know, and um, it, it, since many people are passing through, it, it makes some more sense in a setting like this to have a special chapel reserved. And there is a beautiful chapel just off to the side of the Blessed Sacrament Chapel where the Eucharist is reserved. It's also an ancient notion in the church that the Blessed Sacrament is not reserved on the altar in which a bishop celebrates. So even if there is a tabernacle, the instruction is that the tabernacle is emptied for the celebration of the bishop's mass. We retain that for the Holy Thursday, even for priests on Holy Thursday. The Archbishop washes his hands as the conclusion of the ablution and the cleansing of the sacred vessels comes now to an end. Another feature of these older liturgies is the choir is seldom seen. And um, this is, I think, a, something of a problem in some modern settings in the church, uh, where choirs are, well, at times it feels like there's a performance. And um, this is not a performance. This is all directed to God, to God's glory, His majesty. It does edify God's people. And we're grateful for the gifts, but uh, there's no need to see the choir. There's no need for personal glory or soloists who are approved or what have you. This is. Is there God's people singing on behalf of all God's people uh, to the glory of the Trinity? The Archbishop reverences the altar and greets the people. He then goes to sing the post-communion prayer. 
divinis refecti muneribus te domine supliciter exoramus ut beate manie virginis intercessione cuius immaculati cordis solemnia venerando regimus a presentibus periculis liberati eterne vitae gaudia consequamur Refreshed by these divine gifts, we humbly beseech Thee, O Lord, that by the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose Immaculate Heart we now solemnly celebrate, we may be delivered from present dangers and obtain the joys of eternal life. Through Christ our Lord. Now we have the dismissal. as I am have offered in thy sight may be acceptable to thee and he imparts the blessing which is given pontifically in its most solemn form for which he receives the mitre and the crozier sit nomen domini benedictum adjutorium nostrum in nomine domini Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. The older form of the Mass concludes with the so-called last gospel, the reading in the case of a sung or solemn mass quietly of the prologue to St. John's gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Some liturgical theories that this practice actually develops as a kind of an exorcism over the people. The first gospel is still used in the rites of exorcism, in both the older rite and the newer rite of exorcism. And the simple fact of the darkness not being over and the darkness not overcoming the light uh, speaks to the glorious light of our Lord Jesus Christ dispelling the powers of darkness. So reminds us that we experience the effects of the incarnation in the celebration of the holy sacrifice of the mass where Christ is truly made present in our midst by the proclamation of his word but in a most glorious and sublime way by the presence of the sacrament of his body and blood. So to the strains of Bach's pièce d'orgue, the great procession forms up now and this solemn pontifical mass at the throne draws to its conclusion.
ought to uh, certainly, while this procession forms to head out of the church, make some thanksgivings. Um, I've already mentioned the, the Paulus Institute, but again, they, we ought to not only be grateful, but also generous. Uh, if you can get online and go to the paulusinstitute.org and make a donation, that would help defray the cost and, and therefore participate in the sacrifice of this Mass. That would be certainly, I know, appreciated by them. They did not formally ask me to say that, but I think I should still say it. I would also say that we should be very, very grateful to the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception and uh, for their generosity and their graciousness in sponsoring this liturgy, um, helping us to celebrate it here. We certainly also should be deeply grateful for all of the servers, the acolytes, all the sacred ministers, and again, remember the hours of practice and learning that go behind the scenes for these beautiful liturgies. Uh, these are those who take these things very seriously. We should thank our scola, we should thank our choir, we should uh, certainly now as we see him thank Archbishop Samples and the beautiful people of Portland and we, we ask God's mercy upon all of them as well in that beautiful part of the country. We should also then be grateful and thankful to EWT and the Eternal Word Television Network for their beautiful productions. Um, I think we can all say that it's um, these this, this work that they do in, in bringing these liturgies to us is, is quite remarkable and beautiful. So the clergy who have assisted in choir are now leaving the sanctuary in procession. Among them seminarians and members of various religious communities from Washington and further afield. Many of the young priests that you see are studying at Catholic University, the Dominican House of Studies, the various universities of the city are sent by their bishops or superiors for graduate study here in Washington. Just catch sight now of Father Andrew Menke, the secretary of the Department for Divine Worship of the United States Bishops' Conference. Catch sight of a, a prelate at the end of the procession. He is core Bishop Anthony Spinoza, Proto Presbyter and Rector of the Basilica and National Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon, of the Maronite Catholic Eparchy of Our Lady of the Lebanon, North Jackson, Ohio. And now, of course, the Archbishop, the celebrant of this magnificent pontifical liturgy attended by his sacred ministers, leaves the sanctuary and brings this most wonderful Mass to its conclusion. I certainly want to thank you, Monsignor Wadsworth, and say a little bit of a word. You also uh, are a member of the Oratorian community here, St. Philip Neri here in D.C., and let's pray for your great work here and also in your work with ISIL, the International Commission of English and the Liturgy. You've done wonderful work in helping to restore more accurate translations, and that's a hard work and at times very controversial. But you've done great work, and I'm certainly, certainly most grateful for it. Monsignor, thank you for your encouragement. It's been a complete pleasure to, to be involved with this wonderful occasion, and let's pray that through the sacred liturgy, the Lord will, will be more greatly loved and understood, and that the message of the gospel through the truths of the Catholic faith may be proclaimed more effectively to the people of our time. Certainly, we've all received great encouragement in today's Pontifical Mass. And as the Archbishop passes through the Basilica now, he is blessing the people who kneel to receive his blessing, perhaps a very eloquent sign of what we have received in this Mass today, God's blessing something that we take with us into our lives and to those with whom we find ourselves. There's that great Christ in glory. If you look carefully at his eyes, they're a little bit different. One's stern on the, on the, uh, 
on the right side, and the other is, is the other is, is the other is open, more gentle. That's very common with Eastern iconography. Again, we thank all of you who have tuned into this beautiful celebration to pray with us. We're grateful for your presence, and we encourage your generosity to both the network and to the Paulus Institute and all who help make the beautiful liturgies possible. We're just going to sign off now and ask Almighty God's blessing upon all of you. May our Lord be blessed. Amen. Amen.